You can't expect the man in the street to know whether you're a bad German or a good German. He stared at her. Then suddenly he too smiled. To be a good German, I must be on time at my work. Good morning. Tuppence stared after him. Then she said to herself, Mrs. Blenkinsop, you stopped being a silly man chaser then. Pay more attention in future. Now for breakfast. Inside Sans Souci, Mrs. Perenna was having a conversation with someone. And get the cooked ham at Quiller's. It was cheaper last time there, and be careful about the vegetables. She stopped as Tuppence entered. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Blenkinsop. You're up early. Breakfast is all ready in the dining room. She pointed to her companion. This is my daughter, Sheila. You haven't met her. She only came home last night. Tuppence looked with interest at Sheila. The girl she had just seen talking to Carl von Dynam. Tuppence said a few pleasant words and went into the dining room. There were three people having breakfast, Mrs. Sprout and her baby girl, and Mrs. O'Rourke. The old woman looked at Tuppence with huge interest. It's a fine thing to be out walking before breakfast, she remarked. A grand appetite it gives you. Nice bread and milk, darling, said Mrs. Sprout to her daughter, trying to put a spoonful into the child's mouth. But baby Betty cleverly avoided this by a quick movement of her head and stared at Tuppence with large, round eyes. She pointed a milky finger at the newcomer, gave her a brilliant smile and said, Gaga Booch! She likes you, cried Mrs. Sprout, smiling warmly at Tuppence. Booch! said Betty Sprout. A pussa bag! she added. And what does she mean by that? demanded Mrs. O'Rourke with interest. She doesn't speak very clearly yet, confessed Mrs. Sprout. She's only just over two, you know. She can say mamma, though, can't you, darling? Betty looked thoughtfully at her mother and said, Gugglebick! It's a language of their own they have, the little angels, said Mrs. O'Rourke. Betty, darling, say mamma now. Betty looked hard at Mrs. O'Rourke, frowned, and said with great emphasis, Naza! She's doing her best, and a lovely, sweet girl she is. Mrs. O'Rourke stood up with difficulty, smiled in a frightening manner at Betty, and walked slowly out of the room. Ka, 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 said Betty with huge satisfaction, and beat the table with her spoon. Tuppence asked with a grin, What does Naza really mean? I'm afraid it's what Betty says when she doesn't like anyone or anything, Mrs. Sprout said, her face reddening. I thought so, said Tuppence, laughing. Mrs. O'Rourke tries to be kind, said Mrs. Sprout, but she is alarming with that deep voice. The door opened, and Major Bletchley and Tommy appeared. Tuppence began to play the part of a man-chasing widow. Ah, Mr. Meadows, she called out. I got back before you, but I've left you a little breakfast. She pointed to the chair beside her. Tommy sat down at the other end of the table. Betty Sprout said, Butch! To Major Bletchley, who was delighted. And how's little Miss Betty this morning? Tuppence, who was watching all of them, thought, There must be some mistake. There can't be anything suspicious going on here. There simply can't. Chapter 3 On the sunny terrace outside, Miss Minton was knitting. Good morning, Mrs. Blenkinsop. I do hope you slept well. Mrs. Blenkinsop admitted that she never slept very well the first night or two in a strange bed, then added, What a very pretty pattern that is you were knitting. Miss Minton looked pleased. 
I'm not very good at knitting, Tuppence went on. I can only do simple things like balaclavas for the soldiers, and even now I'm afraid I've gone wrong somewhere. I'd never done any before this terrible war, but one feels that one must do something. Oh, yes, indeed. And you have a boy in the Navy? Yes, my eldest. Then I have a boy in the Air Force, and Cyril, my youngest, is out in France. Oh, dear, dear, how terribly worried you must be. Tuppence thought of her son. Oh, Derek, my darling Derek, out there in terrible danger, and here I am acting the part of a worried mother, when it's what I really am. She said aloud, We must all be brave, mustn't we? I was told the other day by someone in a very high position that the Germans can't possibly fight for more than another two months. Mr. and Mrs. Cayley had come out on the terrace. Mr. Cayley sat in a chair, and his wife put a blanket over his knees. What's that you were saying? he asked. We're saying, said Miss Minton, that it will all be over by the autumn. Nonsense, said Mr. Cayley. This war is going to last at least six years. Oh, Mr. Cayley, protested Tuppence, you don't really think so? Yes, he said. I give it six years. You dear ladies are being completely unrealistic. Now, I know Germany very well from my business dealings before I retired. I can assure you that Germany can continue practically indefinitely with Russia behind her, Mr. Cayley went on, approval in his voice. Mrs. Sproat came out with Betty and sat her down with a small woolen dog with only one ear and a woolen doll's jacket. There, Betty, she said. You dress up Bonzo ready for his walk while Mummy gets ready to go out. Betty started talking to Bonzo in her own language. Truckle, truckly, parbat, said Betty. Mr. Cayley, noticing that no one was paying him any attention, continued angrily. As I was saying, Germany has such a perfect system of... Tuppence could feel someone behind her. She turned her head. It was Mrs. Perenna, her eyes on the group. And there was something in those eyes. Contempt? Tuppence thought, I must find out more about Mrs. Perenna. Tommy was making friends with Major Bletchley. You brought some golf clubs with you, didn't you, Meadows? We must have a game together. The course has lovely views over the sea, and it's never very crowded. What about coming along with me this morning? Thanks very much. I'd like it. I must say, I'm glad you've arrived, remarked Bletchley as they were walking up the hill. There are too many women in that place. It gets annoying. I'm glad there's another man to talk to. You can't count Cayley. The man talks of nothing but his health. If he went out for a good ten-mile walk every day, he'd be a different man. And I'm not sure about Von Dynam. No, said Tommy. No, this refugee business is dangerous. I'd intern the lot of them. We need to be cautious. Carl Von Dynam came over here only a month before the war began. That's a bit suspicious. Then you think, began Tommy, spying. But surely there's nothing of great military or naval importance around here. But it's on the coast, isn't it? And anyone could come over here and talk about their brothers in concentration camps. He's a Nazi. That's what he is. A Nazi. The Major won their game of golf, which delighted him. Good match, Meadows. Very good match. Come along and I'll introduce you to some of the others in the clubhouse. Nice lot. Ah, here's Haydock. You'll like Haydock. Retired naval man. He has that house on the cliff next door to us. He's our local air raid precaution warden. You know, he patrols the streets at night to make sure no lights are showing to attract the German bomber pilots. <laughs>
Commander Haydock was a big man with intensely blue eyes and a habit of shouting most of the time. So, you're going to keep Bletchley company at Sans Souci? He'll be glad of another man. Rather too many females, eh, Bletchley? I'm not that much of a ladies' man, said Major Bletchley. Nonsense, said Haydock. Not your type of lady, my boy, that's all. Old ladies with nothing to do but talk about other people and knit. You're forgetting the landlady's daughter, Miss Perenna, said Bletchley. Ah, oh, Sheila. She's an attractive girl, all right. I'm a bit worried about her, said Bletchley. She's seeing too much of that German fellow. Hmm, that's bad. He's a good-looking young man, but we can't have that sort of thing. Making friends with the enemy? Oh, we can't allow that. There are plenty of decent young English fellows about. Bletchley added, Sheila's a strange girl. There are times when she will hardly speak to anyone. Spanish blood, said Commander Haydock. Her father was half Spanish, wasn't he? He looked at his watch. It's time for the news. We'd better go in and listen to it. There was little news that day. After commenting with approval on the latest activities of the Air Force, the commander talked about his favourite theory, that the Germans would try to land at Lee Hampton simply because it was such an unimportant spot. There's not even an anti-aircraft gun in the place. Terrible! Haydock then gave Tommy an invitation to come and see his house, Smuggler's Rest. I've got a marvellous view, my own beach. Bring him along, Bletchley. It was decided that Tommy and Major Bletchley should come for drinks on the evening of the following day. After lunch at Sans Souci, Mr Meadows walked down to the pier. There were some children running up and down, screaming in voices that matched the screaming of the seabirds, and one man sitting on the end, fishing. Mr. Meadows stood beside him and looked down into the water. Then he asked gently, Caught anything? The fisherman shook his head. I don't often catch anything, Mr. Grant said without turning his head. What about you, Meadows? I've nothing much to report as yet, sir. I've made friends with Major Bletchley, who seems the usual type of retired officer. Cayley seems to be a genuine invalid. However, he was in Germany frequently during the last few years. And, of course, there's von Dynam. Yes, I'm interested in von Dynam. N or M may not be at Sans Souci. It may be Karl von Dynam who is there, reporting to them. Through him, we may be led to them. But I can tell you in confidence, Beresford, that very nearly all Germans in this country are going to be interned. You've had the other guests at Sans Souci checked, I suppose, sir? Grant sighed. No, I could ask the department to check easily enough, but I can't risk it, Beresford. I'm not sure we don't have a traitor in the department itself. If anyone guesses that I'm watching Sans Souci, then the organization may find out. That's why you've got to work without help from us. They must not know. There's only one person I've been able to check up on. Who's that, sir? Carl von Dynam. That was easy enough because it's routine to check foreigners. And what was the result? Carl is exactly what he says he is. His father who was against the Nazis, was arrested and died in a concentration camp. Carl's elder brothers are in camps. His mother died a year ago. He got to England a month before war began. Von Dynam said he wanted to help this country, and his work in a chemical research laboratory has been excellent. Then he's all right? Not necessarily. There are two possibilities. The whole von Dynam family could be deceiving us, or else this is not the real Carl von Dynam, but a man playing the part of Carl von Dynam. He seems a very nice young man, said Tommy slowly. Sighing unhappily, Grant replied, They nearly always are.
But what about the women in this place? I think there's something strange about the woman who runs it. Mrs. Perenna? Yes. There's a young mother, an unmarried woman who knits, the invalid stupid wife, and a rather terrifying-looking old Irish woman. All seem harmless enough. That's everyone? No. There's a Mrs. Blenkinsop, arrived three days ago. Well? demanded Grant. Mrs. Blenkinsop is my wife. What? I thought I told you not to say a word to your wife. And I didn't. With a quiet pride, Tommy told Grant what Tuppence had done. There was a silence. Then Grant laughed. She's wonderful. East Hampton told me not to leave her out. I wouldn't listen to him. It shows you, though, how careful you've got to be not to be overheard. Yes, she's a smart woman, your wife. Tell her the department will consider it an honour if she will agree to work with us. I'll tell her, said Tommy with a grin. I don't suppose you could persuade your wife to keep out of danger, Tommy said slowly. I wouldn't want to do that. Tuppence and I, you see... We go into things together, always. Chapter 4 When Tuppence entered the lounge at Sans Souci just before dinner, the only person in the room was Mrs. O'Rourke, who was sitting by the window like a gigantic Buddha. Or oh, now, sit here now, Mrs. Blankensop, and tell me what you've been doing with yourself this fine day, and how you like Lee Hampton. There was something about Mrs. O'Rourke that fascinated Tuppence. She was like a character from a fairy tale, huge and ugly, with a deep voice like a man's. Tuppence replied that she thought she was going to like Lee Hampton very much, and be happy there. That is, she added in an unhappy voice, as happy as I can be anywhere with this terrible anxiety that's with me all the time. Or oh, now, don't you be worrying yourself. Those boys of yours will come back to you safe and sound. One of them's in the Air Force, I think you said? Yes, Raymond. And is he in France now, or in England? He's in Egypt, according to his last letter. Well, that's not exactly what he said. We have a little private code, if you know what I mean. You see, I feel I must know just where he is. Mrs. O'Rourke nodded her Buddha-like head. I know how you feel. If I had a boy out there, I'd be fooling the censor in the same way. I feel so lost without my three boys, Tuppence said sadly. There's always been at least one of them at home, so I thought I'd come somewhere quiet. Again, the Buddha nodded. I agree with you entirely. London is no place to be at the present. I've lived there myself for many years now. I used to sell antiques, and I had a shop in Chelsea. I had lovely stuff there, and some good customers. But there you are. When there's a war on, no one is interested in buying antiques. But I'm not one of those that's always complaining. Not like Mr. Cayley with his illnesses and his talk of his failing business. Of course it's going badly. There's a war on. And there's his wife, who never says no to him. Then there's that little Mrs. Sprout, always worrying about her husband, Arthur. Is he out at the front? No. He's a clerk in an office, and so terrified of air raids, he sent his wife down here at the beginning of the war. Mind you, I think that's the best thing for the child, and a nice little girl she is. But Mrs. Sprout keeps saying Arthur must miss her so. But if you ask me, Arthur's not missing her much. Tuppence murmured, I'm terribly sorry for all these mothers.